Henri de Toulouse Lautrec. What does that name provoke in terms of thought and the work of art that you have? Lautrec was the premier decadent artist of the female form and of intimacy itself. But he himself was, how shall I say it, not exactly the most erotic of bodies, if you will. He had a condition that stunted his growth. He was, by today's standard, I guess you could say, a manlit incel, if you will. What does this have to do with what I wanted to talk about today? I wanted to talk about today this tweet thread that came up, or rather, a thread that I composed in response to this tweet by an account called Going Godward. Now, it's not going to be another Twitter thread crawl. I'm going to put a bit more effort into it. If you so care to enjoy this video, then like, subscribe, share, all that stuff. I have a PayPal link, just in case, you know, whatever you think is fair. Henri de toulouse lautrec he was the premier decadent artist of the 19th century in France. He was friends with Van Gogh and with other uh, artists of the time. Freshenism done in an explicitly decadent Parisian way, which wasn't similar to the Expressionism that came after with the German Expressionists, with the Blue Riders, uh, De Brucke, with, um, with a bunch of other movements around that time. Uh, he really expressed that, I would say, perfect moment, European history, where the sort of pre-war period, pre-World War I, of course, where things were a bit more open and urbanized and sort of the horrors of the Industrial Revolution were at least abated for a certain class. What does this have to do with this thread? Okay, so one of the famous paintings by Lutrec, The Bed, reveal I mean, there's other ones, of course. Um, what was it called? The Night of the Moulin Rouge and so forth. Now, but the famous one is from a series of these images that depict discreet, intimate moments that give a window into, albeit bourgeois and uh, maybe highly romanticized, versions of the experience between the masculine and feminine at the most unguarded of moments. Now, as an artist who myself does not conform to a perfect picture of a eroticized male being. I'll say no more with that. <laughs> but ladies, whoever is watching this, free to disagree with me. Sorry, I wanted to show how the work of art, in particular of Lautrec, is very, is sort of copacetic with what we are going to talk about with this thread. Because it presents a number of issues for our own time that can, I would say, strike a chord with a lot of people. Now, Let's get on to this thread. Now, Going Onward apparently is one of, I don't want to sort of place a category on people, but it's sort of one of these accounts that has come up in recent years of, let's say, female writers who are like the millennial uh, confessional form of writing and who are sort of disenfranchised by the, what does my friend uh, Catherine D, D for friend call it? Millennial 2010 sexuality, that is the, and I terribly, terribly resent using this word, the sexual marketplace that has been totally uh, deregulated, quote unquote. And what we have now is a abandonment of any sort of uh, standards. But in actuality, this realization of a very like libertine sex posy form of relations between men and women or women and women or zer and zer whatever that has left a lot of people out of the equation not just out of the equation entirely but has left a bitter taste in a lot of people's mouths and has in some ways in a lot of ways not just disenfranchised men but also women and a lot of these writers are going into what will be traditionally considered quote-unquote right-wing or uh trad spaces of course they resent this label so what we have is this like weird convergence at a time of supreme decadence that has been soured kind of like the late 80s with rad femmes 
and the Reaganites going after pornography, now we're having the same sort of discourse come around again. I guess it's pretty Lindy that uh, two sides of a disenfranchised uh, extreme can meet in the middle. Now, I wouldn't even say extreme, but can find a common agreement. And there's been a lot of debate whether uh, these people can enter, these women in particular can enter these sort of um, more traditionally masculine focused uh, spaces. And I of course have my debates and reservations, but I think that if anything, it could potentially help aid the discourse, if you will, uh, because any movement, I know this is going to totally sink my credibility as a trad right wing incel, but any move, <laughs> any movement that is going to have some kind of longevity or any political ideology or let's say Watanshang needs, I guess, an implicit consent of the women in the society. Maybe not as a leadership position, of course, that's going way too far, but at least in terms of the needs that women have and not the needs per se, but rather the pursuit of authentic eudaimonic not just happiness in what we consider in the modern hedonic sense but a deeper sort of contentment and flourishing in life that is going to produce better outcomes for that civilization as a whole because us men whether we like it or not we're going to have to realize very quickly there isn't a lot of incentives for uh young women in particular to enter these, not just enter these spaces, but to take more, uh, what would you call it, traditionally rightist ideas seriously. And there's a lot of debate and there is a lot of uh, words I can say about that, but I wanted to sort of get past that. And this is what the thread was saying. So this is going Godward. And of course she got totally ratioed. She got felted, f -f 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 felted from this thread and for various reasons but we'll go into because a lot of it does, I would say, come off as kind of disingenuous, but I'll get into why it comes off as disingenuous. Although I wouldn't say that, I'm not accusing her personally of being disingenuous. I'm saying that the sentiments behind it, the royal we of the drivers, the movers and shakers of the quote unquote sexual marketplace. Again, I hate that term. Let's just call it the sort of driving force of relations between uh, men and women are, of course, the feminine side. They're the choosers and so forth. There's, of course, another debate around, you know, hypergamy. And I, I just think that the typical 2010s manosphere discourse around hypergamy has led to a lot of like bitterness and resentment and so forth. But that's, again, another debate entirely. So here she says, imagine a man sees a young woman through a phone or a computer screen and her body on display seemingly for his pleasure. But instead of liking and lusting, lusting, his heart turns tender and full of compassion, and his desire is to restore her dignity rather than further exploit her body. And then of course someone replies to her, this is one of the older replies, and then a lot of people had a lot of insightful replies, but I will try to um, give you a full picture of what I said in my thread. Someone said to her, uh, this man is a priest. Then she says, every man should be a priest in his heart. And I don't mean the way of celibacy, but the way of compassion and restoring dignity where it has been lost or forgotten. And it goes back and forth. A lot of people were uh, taking umbrage with the whole thread in general. This is a priest, not a man. This is a higher form of chivalrous masculinity. Now right there, we have a problem because this is what my tweet reply was saying. A lot of the blame can go on men for letting things get this bad, but at the same time, you can't really blame young men in toto because you're not working with the raw materiality, the raw materials of masculinity for a variety of reasons. Real genuine masculinity, as we all know, and I'm not going to get in the typical manosphere argument, you know, uh, screed. Typical traditional masculinity has been assaulted on all fronts. We all know this, you know, it's young men have been disenfranchised, um, not just from dating, but uh, higher education and 
job opportunities. And a lot of that has to do with the excesses of uh, the way that late capital has uh, been shaped and, and uh, the way that globalism and globalization has introduced various selection pressures and has derooted us from our original positions and how these sort of boomer um, bourgeois white picket fence Americana fantasy is no longer a viable option for a variety of reasons. A lot of this is tangentially related to what I'm saying, but I wanted to specifically focus on the sentiments of transmuting an eroticism of the body, which is very primitive and grug brain into something that is of a higher ideal when it comes to this, let's call it, spiritual relationship between the masculine and feminine. What do I mean by this? It's complicated, and I will get to how uh, Toulouse Latrac relates to it. But for now, let's say that a lot of these attributes going Godward is striving for when it comes to young men in particular that are absent. Now, a lot of them are of a more ancient form of masculinity. And the problem is that when you have this, well, first of all, accusatory tone, it places a lot of these problems on the shoulders of men who have no training or who have no gravitas and who have no insight into the way things were compassion and restoring dignity. These priestly higher caste attributes that are missing. Now, the problem is two things. Number one, when it comes to the gaze of the male other towards the feminine, it's predicated on this assumption that that gaze is entirely the product of an objectification coming from the masculine and not a sort of uh, weird and unintentional participatory relishing in that gaze from the female other. You know, what does women on the screen mean? It means cam girls, pornography, only fans, nude modeling, and so forth. Number two, the problem is that that gaze may or may not be participatory, but even the suggestion that is participatory is, can is a cancelable offense. That is totally out of the line. That is victim blaming. But really, we all know when it comes down to it, there are this strange dance between that gaze and the seer and who is being seen in that erotic gaze. That eroticism is a product of a implicit mutual reciprocity between the seer and the seen. Not in all circumstances, obviously, there are a lot of circumstances where this gaze is malicious and unintentional and should be discouraged. Obviously, I'm not saying that. I'm not implying that all eroticism when it comes specifically to objectification is intentionally consented to. That's obviously, I'm not saying that. But I will say that when it comes to particularly the, let's call it, pornography industrial complex. This gaze is very complicated. and It's not very easy to pinpoint where objectification begins and ends. The problem is that there's no incentive. The second problem is that there is no incentive to treat particular forms of feminine sexuality with the same degree of contemplation and second order eroticism that requires a higher type of affection than compared to the female nude, for instance. This is where my thread and response was uh, aiming at. Now, some people would say that when it comes down to quote unquote sex work, it's inherently, you know, worthy of dignity, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is that when it comes to our primordial unconscious, when we filter out these experiences, there is no difference. There is still those connection between the psychobiological and the psychic and spiritual realities that are there, which views certain types of erotic displays as invitational and titillating and of a lower order. This is the problem. You're taking something that is very old, that is very primordial, that is, I would say, of a higher spiritual nature, which is for that masculine other to give the feminine this form of authenticity 
and belonging and affection and love that is really as you know Ralph Waldo Emerson would say all that love is a stand-in for the higher more noumenal love of God. The problem is you're taking that play you want to place it on something that by its very nature it cannot go because there is a transactional and profaned commodified relationship going on between seeing a OnlyFans model on the screen who pretends to very lonely, very disenfranchised young men, not just young men, but let's say men who traditionally are displaced from that relationship between the feminine and the masculine, who exist in an abjected state, sort of subject to this purposeful simulation of what real affection is and what real love and compassion and intimacy is. You are taking that and you are placing that in the same realm, for example, the Renaissance nude is. That was my point, is that that same aesthetic experience that by its own nature, and of course there's art critics like Berger who contend with this, there's a lot of feminist art critics who deny this, but I would say that they are in part wrong because I still, as you know, an artist myself, and as someone who uh, is, let's say, more traditionally minded, I still want to believe in the hope of the nude, of the feminine nude, as being the highest form of humanly beauty. I say humanly as a predicate because there are other forms of divine beauty, for example, in the landscape, because I myself, you know, started off as a landscape painter. I still think that there is a possibility that this eroticism that one experiences from the work of art can become something spiritual and be what Godward is aiming at. The problem is the raw materials we're dealing with do not provoke the same response. Because when I look at a portrait of a feminine nude, when I witness the feminine other, then my heart is filled with these sentiments of longing and affection, and yes, also sexuality, but that sexuality is second place to what that sexual experience is aiming for. It is not just merely titillation in a profane sense. It is witnessing the beauty of the feminine other from the perspective of the male gaze. Because remember, as Artie Lang says, the other gives you authenticity, but can take it away. This is a notion that is very controversial and I just can hear the criticism of this from a mile away. To say that the masculine gaze gives a sense of authenticity and compassion and wholeness to the feminine as the feminine gives to the masculine. I know that this is a very controversial statement, especially coming from someone like me who is just a damn dirty uh, whatever internet dweller incel, whatever. Ah, terrible. As controversial as it is, these are forces that we have been dealing with since the dawn of time itself, since the dawn of human consciousness, of human sentience has been given to us. We have been contending with this relationship of the masculine and feminine. And yes, this is a sort of binary essentialization of the masculine and feminine that of course is a terribly out of style with current uh, academic analysis, especially in you know art history but let's bracket all of that criticism and let's go for a sort of honesty with what we're dealing with here we are incapable of viewing that transmigration between a lower and base form of eroticism to a higher eroticism when it comes to the modern conditions of alienation, atomization, I should say sexuality that is decoupled from eroticism itself because these things are a product of de-eroticization. What do I mean by that? We are incapable of expressing such things because even expressing such sentiments is met with scorn and derision by both men and women, I would say especially women. Because to admit that you view the feminine in this erotic display as a form of immense compassion and longing and want, the omission of that longing and that view of wanting something more 
than just base titillation is itself met with extreme suspicion for a number of reasons. On the sort of masculine uh, side, and a lot of uh, right wing, you know, post manosphere discourse that is simping and that is being disingenuous and that is admitting to a fault in one's character. But I would say the more extreme version is of of course, the, you know, leftist male feminist variety because that sort of deference and care and display of affection towards the feminine is met with suspicion because a lot of very terrible people have used that to their advantage as a sort of predatory uh, pastiche. And therefore, any overt affection that men display to women nowadays, especially in the online world, is sort of met with this tinge of suspicion, more than a tinge. And so these things are rendered impossible nearly because we don't really know what that intimacy looks like. And you could see in the replies, people mentioning Travis Bickle, which is a very good example. He's a taxi driver. He wants this deeper connection to his love interest, but there is the reality of being a sort of proto incel, living in squalor, being acquainted with the dangers of modern living and being a dispossessed and jaded veteran. There are so many things that prevent him from truly realizing and achieving that goal of integrating the feminine other into himself. When he takes her to that porno show, he thinks that she's going to have the same connection that Travis does towards it. But she just thinks he's a creepy, you know, a porno creep, right? I think that was the term they used back in the day. There was a corn song, by the way, porno creep. People uh, are replying to this thread saying that really this is impossible. This is just simping. Or when men do reveal their feelings, they are met with scorn and derision by women and they are cast out as being nothing more but predators and simps and incels. And these are all real. But what is an example of turning the, let's say, more femme fatale and degraded forms of female objectification into something higher? As it almost equally is impossible to turn the more bestial predatory nature of certain men into a productive force outside of the confines, for example, rituals around warfare, where men who in traditional societies would have been the sort of warrior Katria class, there is no outlet for these feelings anymore. But I would say the work of art can still give us a picture of what transforming these feelings into a higher type of sentiment and spiritual connection looks like. Now, this is where uh, Toulouse Latra comes in because in his works of art, he was commissioned to paint the decorative interiors for one of the brothels that he f frequented, to lack of a better term. And he painted portraits of women that he saw there and m women that he knew, and he painted them in the most sympathetic and loving way possible. He was known for, in his sort of uh, decadent 19th century Parisian style, for his looseness and his energetic brushwork and his connection to a subtle form of sentimentality that is lacking in the stark and gloomy and even masculine expressionism that came after him. He took these prosties, sorry, sex workers that he was seeing and he portrayed them as sympathetic as he possibly could, but he portrayed them in those intimate moments of the afterglow of sex, of kissing in bed, of waking up next to a lover, various cabaret women, half in costume. He saw those unseen moments of feminine expression the way that no other artist of his day could. And he took women, actresses, you know, the cabaret women, because back in the day, up until the later 19th century and early 20th century, actors were seen as lower than quote unquote sex workers. They were never trusted in any society, but now they are at the absolute top and pinnacle of celebritydom in the culture industry. Isn't it funny how inverted and profaned our society has become? I wrote a whole essay I could link to in the description back in the day. It was called Reprobate Hollywood from Ancient to Modern in Thermidor Magazine, but it, there's a archive on my WordPress. Lautrec took their 
commodified utilitarian alienated state of being sex workers and he made them beautiful not just a beauty that is meant for the sexual arousal and titillation of men not for a grug brain i see this woman i want to have sex with them type of beauty but he truly beautified them in a divine sense he made them archetypal he rendered them into something that is revealing of moments that are very rarely seen except for between the most intimate of lovers he gave people a window into a realistic depiction of the feminine but one that has within it a striving wholeness he did all of this through his works of art he took the lowest forms of feminine sexuality and ontological being and he made them into the highest forms of female embodiment this is in my opinion the only serious way we can approach this problem of on one end the gaze of the masculine degrading the feminine and placing them in a role of commodified uh, objectivity, placing them within a role of commodification via a debasement of the erotic. And on the other end, a sort of cynicism and an inversion of the feminine that has gutted itself of all sort of uh, nurturing and care and sensuality for the purposes of a very strange and very alien form of empowerment that is really just LARPing the worst forms of masculine exploitation. Now the feminine has become so inverted and bestial is a product of an inversion of the male gaze, but not a proper inversion, rather an inversion towards a form of self-effacement. The incel that pays for OnlyFans is an inversion, a profanation of masculinity because they are men who, for whatever reason, and there are numerous reasons, have not been able to cope with what has transpired in terms of the post-sexual revolution society. Now you can say that, well, they're losers and they should have, you know, they deserve it and that want to exploit women and so forth. But you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have this millennial sex posi feminism and be met with a form of authentic compassion and longing and want and care when the displays of sort of gratuitous pornographic sexuality can't be filtered into something else in our lizard brain. The masculine lizard brain will always mistake form for the essence, the aesthetic picture for the reality. There is no difference. In a on a deeper unconscious level, there is no difference between a simulation of something and the reality of something. And a lot of young women are starting to see this. They're starting to see that the bargain that they've made has been detrimental but a lot of young men as well i think that we should strive for something more that the inherent suspicion of a display of affection towards the feminine from men shouldn't be met with immediate derision and scorn that perhaps maybe we have to get back to a more authentic and a more real sensual and sincere form of expression when it comes to the masculine or feminine other. And we have to realize that it's going to take generations before we can restore this sacred pact between the masculine and feminine. And that the only way I think in my mind we can do this is if we do look at artists like Toulouse Lautrec. Because the only way forward is if we are instructed with something that gives us a spiritualized form of eroticism because the erotic is inherently tied to so many different things sex and death sex and rebirth spirituality religious longing and exastic longing there are always these strange connections between the transgressive nature of the erotic and the sacred nature and to just cast it aside for a intensely alienating form of modern pathological contractualism 
between men and women and well men and men whatever an egalitarianism that is really just a flattening pulling away of what came to us on a deeper level to fulfill some kind of social picture that is predicated on a hedonic treadmill this is the problem but the demands that are placed on men to restore this order i think is wrong-headed just as equally wrong-headed as it is for a lot of the manosphere types to place all social ills on the machinations of a more quote-unquote empowered form of the feminine these are very deep issues but i use artists like Lautrec to illustrate how we can get back to a productive, a more compassionate form of erotic expression between the masculine and feminine. So there is a quote here. Uh, Think of Toulouse Trek. The first thing that springs to mind may be exuberant scenes filled with black stockings and white underskirts, white hats and red scarves, dance halls crowded with theatrical revelers. Some lesser known, though not no less memorable, are his more intimate studies, such as the series showing prostitutes together in bed, painted sometimes between 1892 and 1895. This is from a art critic of the sapphic variety, if you know what I mean. The Trek's depiction of lesbianism is partially, particularly notable because it, does, it doesn't fetishize sexual intimacy between men and women present as spectacle for the male gaze. Lautrec was trying to capture small and tender moments in the lives of women he met, and he did so with humanity and sensitivity. In a world of constructed sexuality and fantasy, he finds the real relationships and reveals to us the hidden lives of queer women in the 19th century. It's also worth noting that the picture were made in brothels, catered to heterosexual male customers, adding another layer to our interpretation. By emphasizing these women's individuality and mutual affection, Toulouse Lautrec provides us, in the words of curator of the National Gallery of Australia, a glimpse of real intimacy in an otherwise constructed world of sexual extravagance and simulated fantasy. Now, is that not pertinent to what we are dealing with now? To take the fantasy of the erotic in the OnlyFans model and pornography and to take that and deny its bedazzlement upon the lizard brain and make it into something higher. The problem is, I fear that this is almost impossible nowadays because we are dealing with forces beyond our control. What do you guys think?